Hey, this is Vince Papali. I'm a fellow Hawk brother, and of course, I'm the guy from Invincible. And you're listening to Sports and Rants with Brett and Pants right here on 1851. My Hawk brothers, and the Hawk will never die. And we are on with former Philadelphia Flyer, Carolina Hurricane, and St. Louis Blue, Jesse Bullries. Hey, Jesse, how you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're doing great. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. No, thanks for having me. All right, so we're going to start out with some opening questions. Um, do you still follow hockey today, and do you still watch it? Uh, I do, probably not as much as I should, but uh, I do still enjoy watching the games, especially in the playoffs. Any specific teams you watch? Uh, I'm living, I've settled in Raleigh here, so I've stayed really in touch with the Hurricanes. Obviously still watch the Flyers and um, you know the Kings the last couple of years, watching them, and I played with a lot of the guys out there that, as you know, are from the Flyers that I had a lot of good times with. Uh, any thoughts on the upcoming season? Uh, Stanley Cup champion, anybody yet? I mean, I don't know. I think L.A. is going to be hard to beat. Even though it's hard to have a dynasty these days, they are such a strong team, and they, they have a lot of their core guys are going to be there for a while. They're still pretty young. Now, growing I'm going to pull for them. Growing up, how did you get interested in hockey? You grew up in upstate New York. I grew up on the on a, in a small border town as a dairy farmer, and I did I knew I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so the the best out was to uh, play hockey, and I just loved it. I was just so passionate about it from a young age. It's all I ever wanted to do. Was it? present in your hometown was it something that every kid did growing up uh, not every kid uh, but there was definitely a lot of us that would go out and play every day every night every weekend um, so it, it wasn't as prevalent as uh, western new york or you know quebec and ontario obviously but uh, our area had a, a few of us that were addicted is there a youth coach that you would say that it had the most impact on your skills or your play style? Uh, Youth-wise, I would just definitely say my first coach was um, Peck Sample, and he he definitely strung me along and, and uh, helped me as I was a little bit clumsy that age. I was, I was tall, very young, uh, and he helped stick with me and, and get me um, get me Get, developed my skills, I guess, uh, and, and gave me the most drive. Now, as a kid coming out of upstate New York and then now being drafted in the NHL, what was that draft pr- process like for you? Well, to be honest, like I, I was there and, and had been ranked for a, you know, a couple years and second round early on, and, and uh, ranking dropped to the fifth, which is where I went. But even though all that had, had been happening, I still just didn't have I didn't come to the realization that I actually could get drafted I I just was such a small town kid that everybody I always said could never make it and no one from our area will ever make it I mean draft day was just a dream come true I just couldn't believe that it actually had happened so it was it was kind of a yeah I think I think I just didn't want to believe it could could happen until it happened, and then I still when it still when it happened I didn't believe I could make the NHL <laughs> I think. <laughs> I honestly think I, I guess it was 16 when I got drafted, and I uh, I guess it was 22 or 23 before I really decided, like, hey, if I work hard, I can do this, and, and that's when I made it happen. Now, did you expect to be drafted by the Flyers? Did they show any interest in you going into that draft? Uh, I didn't. I hadn't heard from anyone from Philly. I had interviewed with a few teams at the draft be- beforehand, and I kind of thought that uh, Carolina was going to draft me because they had tended to draft a lot of the players from our junior team, the Plymouth Whalers, where I played, and thought that that was uh, where it was going to happen. But So it was a shock, but a very pleasant one, and um, I cannot tell you how much I love my Philly years. They were the best years of my life. Yeah, how was that like to be drafted by the Flyers, Philadelphia, big city, you're coming into here? Well, it was just unbelievable. I had never really been to a big city um, you know, I guess Detroit was nearby, but didn't spend much time there in juniors, and it was, it was definitely an eye opener to get thrown into a city like Philly and uh, and start my career in a city where the fans are so passionate as they are. You 
you uh, start up like you mentioned. You started up your career with the with in Philadelphia, and you said it was the best years of your life or career. Why is that so? What was the highlights that made it so great? Oh, I, I think it was just you know being a young man out of my own early twenties, um, having a great time, just not really having the worries of concerns of family or how am I gonna how am I gonna get by or make it. It was just so so much pleasure and enjoyment to be doing what I dreamed about doing and making a good living doing it. It wasn't it wasn't a job. It was. It was just so fun. During your career, you were a forcer slash fighter or protector. Were you that all throughout growing up? And no, I mean I I'm the same story you hear from the scores or that you know in the early youth I was leading the team in scoring and and again I was I was big so nobody really could knock me off the puck and I'd always just skate through everybody I always lead the team in scoring all the way through. Um, 16, uh, I guess it was when I first went to juniors in Canada and was in a league where fighting was allowed and it, it just seemed to happen and I ex- excelled at it and <laughs> kind of got, <laughs> got pushed that direction. Again, being a big kid, big strong farm boy, um, they pushed me that way because I was good at it. Now, is that a coach that pushed you in that direction to tell you that was the way you are going to get to the NHL or is that more of your decision? Um and coaching, coaching staffs, uh, scouting, and you know I regret letting that happen. Uh, but again, you're you're youthful and you don't really know how you're going to make the NHL, so you just just do whatever coaching staffs tell you and and what you're good at. So you know I don't want to down it. Um, it just it did that part of the game did become very difficult. Again, these stories you read about some of these guys that uh, went through that, the, what happens to you mentally through going through a career like that. I've read a lot of stories, and it seems like I'm reading about my life. But, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound bad because it definitely did get me to the, to the NHL, and, and I had the skills to get there too. So that's what kept me there for a little while at least. How important is the enforcer role on a hockey team? Now, I don't know that it is uh, as much as it used to be. Why is that um, the case? Well, the the way the game has evolved, the way the rule changes have taken shape to that, the speed of the game. Uh, I don't think that people in the game wanted it as much as the fans and, and I guess maybe the evolution of civilization, they look at it as more brutal, brutal than, um, than they did in the past, and which, which is rightfully so. Now, do you think, because like you stated, the NHL enforces now stricter penalties. Do you think this not only hurt your career, but other enforcers' careers, guys that had the skill sets to play NHL hockey and the score, but chose to be that enforcer role? Well, I do think it affected us, and the the bad part about it is that I mean, not all of the enforcers had the skills, obviously, but uh, I feel I did, and I had a lot of coaches tell me I did. But the problem was the timing with the changes. Uh, at that point in my career, there was a perception, and that perception was not going to be changed. The league looked at. All, the league stereotyped all enforcers, and it just was very difficult to make anyone's opinion change of you that, that you actually could play um, and take on more of a, more minutes and more of a role. You know, I have all the confidence that I could have just at the midpoint of my career when the lockout happened. You know, that's just the way it evolved. Yeah. So, do you feel like you're? Your skills were never properly demonstrated on the ice. Yeah, I don't. I really, honestly, don't believe I had the chance to show that uh, I could play. I mean, I, I watched a lot of guys in my career play more minutes on second and third lines, and I'm, I, there's no doubt to this day in my mind I had better skills, and I had I had other people confirming that with me constantly. You know, some coaches, yeah. You know, 
that would pull me aside and, and confirm it with me, uh, but just weren't weren't the head boss, head honcho, calling the shots on the minute. So, yeah, that's just the way it went down. To focus more on Philadelphia, you you played with the Flyers and the Phantoms. What was it like in Philadelphia, as particularly with the fans, compared to the other cities that you played in during your career? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I I'm telling you, I played, I believe, 170 some games down here, and actually only uh, I want to say it was five or six games with the Flyers, uh, and maybe 150, 200 with the Phantoms. And I go to Philly and get more recognized every day of the week than I do down here, <laughs> just walking around uh, Xfinity Center or even downtown or on the South Jersey side. So it's 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 fun going back there, which uh, my wife is from Voorhees. So we go there regularly, and you know, I get that recognition. is is kind of fun. Now, what was it like to play with those guys in the locker room? You played with some great flyers. What was that experience like for you? Uh, it was unbelievable. Guys like John LeClaire, who I uh, grew up a, a fan of. He was playing up in Vermont. And Jeremy Roenick, of course, you know, with the big personality, just you know, taught me a lot of things in the locker room and, and how to be an unbelievable team guy. And I, I remember you know, playing with J.R., uh, and him coming to me and thanking me for pl- doing the role I was doing, and <laughs> it, was just, it was it was just like wow, this is great, you know. Uh, yeah, I've arrived, I guess is, is how they put it. But um, yeah, just such great players that come through Philly, and legends, and it was just a treat to play with. Now during the oh seven oh eight season with the Flyers, you would get one of the longest suspensions in NHL history, the twenty five game suspension. Do you think that that showed the uh, Broad Street bully mentality of the Flyers? Did you bring back some of that old days of the Flyers? You know, that's, that's, I don't look at it that way. It was a moment in time, a split second, a uh, bad decision. Um, definitely, definitely a bad decision. But it, it wasn't like I sat there and premeditated, I'm going to go and do this. Uh, it was just, a, a game where we were it was not the game wasn't on the line and it was I felt a liberty taken at our player and I guess wanted to you know make sure that sort of thing didn't happen with our team and it was a second game of the year so I was still fighting for a job at the same time and just again horrible timing in my career <laughs> one of the <laughs> one of the neg- negative things I don't like to reflect back on but uh yeah, that's just how it happened. But do, do you think things like that are is the role that the enforcer has to do? Because if if you don't do that, then somebody would hit a player on your team, a star on your team, and that's the role to protect the stars. Yeah, you're somewhat pushed into doing things like that. You, you can always say it's your decision, but the reality is you're you're trying to keep a job, and you're signing year-to-year contracts and yeah. there's no sniff of these multi-year big dollar contracts that you dreamed about when you wanted to play in the NHL you know that that's when it turned into a job and that's that that was again the second half of my career and you just I'm just trying to stay in the league at that point yeah. you know so um now we want to get into a little bit about in 2002 you you left Philadelphia and you went to Carolina what was that like for you? What was the move like leaving a city that you knew for so long? Yeah, that was a surprise. Um, you know, waking up and getting a call from Paul Holmgren about it, and uh, I hadn't played down there, been down, been down here at that point, didn't know anything about the area. But now, obviously, I've settled here with my family and fallen in love and, uh, with the area. The growth here is fantastic, and. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a shock, but it turned out to be a good one. Uh, I don't know if that I would have got in the league when I did if I had still been in Philly. But coming down, get making that trade was in February 2002, and the next year I made the permanent roster down here and, yeah. and, and took a spot. So, how how did the two cities differ in like uh, playing style, fan style? Because you are going down south. How's hockey different there? 
hockey is very different down here. Uh, A lot of people uh, don't know the game, don't understand the rules. There's definitely a lot of transplants down here from from New England and and the Michigan, uh, Illinois crowd and Ohio who know the game and follow it but the, the difficulty is they're all following their old teams and so there's not a really strong fan base here and again you don't get recognized as much walking around town as you do up in philly and, um but style of game i think the whole league is is evolved uh, pretty similarly as every year comes down to the wire and it's just five game uh, five point spread between 12 teams so now coming into it with Carolina, did you expect anything? Like you said, did you expect to make the roster, have that permanent spot on the team? Um, I didn't expect it, but I remember in the summer of 2002 talking with the assistant GM here, Jason Carmanos, and telling him I was going to make his team. <laughs> That's how confident I had gotten. It went from 16 to to 22. Uh, and myself and, and my my abilities, you know, I just never thought it could happen. Just a couple years before that, but that summer I was working four or five hours a day in the gym, and yeah, you know, I remember that phone call from like, telling him I was going to make the team. <laughs> <laughs> now, were guys like uh, Ron Francis and Rod Brindamore happy to have you on the team to protect them? Oh yeah, yeah, those guys were great. I tell you, uh, to this day, we remain close friends and. You know, of course, Ron taking taking the this, the role on with the Hurricanes. He's uh, had us alumni in to see what we can do to help drive ticket sales and and the fan base in the area. Um, still, still looks at me to protect the team, I guess. You know, and and Rod has always been a, a great friend and great teammate. And we're actually uh, we coach different teams, but we're helping out with the youth hockey down here and um, just trying to grow grow the passion down here that we have so um what made you come to the decision to retire and what what factors came into that was it family was it uh those kind of decisions yeah absolutely family uh again again the again the role became a job that i wasn't uh fond of anymore and i didn't see a chance to get back into the nhl so at 30, um, I kind of felt that way at 30, but I played two more years out in the minors with Wilkesbury and, and uh, used the, the Players Association Career Enhancement Program to to get me fired up for my next passion, and, and which is what I'm doing now. as a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch. So the, the Career Enhancement Program took me through personality and passion profiling to help me uh, figure out the figure that out and get licensed and registered to do what I'm doing now. During your career, or one last question on your career, how how did other players view you as far as your reputation? Did they do you feel as though they respected you as a enforcer? I believe that I had a lot of respect from the league from the players. Um uh, some players maybe not, but I, you know, I'd, I'd say it would be the 80/20 rule and you know, maybe maybe twenty percent of them didn't respect me for the, the couple incidents and moments in time where I made made some mistakes. But you know, for the most part, I think I was a very respected fighter uh, ethically, and, and I never jumped guys, and I never suckered guys, and and when it came to the fighting, and I was always fair as as possible, as fair as you can be in a, in a fight. You know, and I think I, I think guys respected that. Now, like you said, uh, you're now a Merrill Lynch financial advisor. You have offices in Carolina as well as in uh, Philadelphia. Could you explain to our listeners what it is you do today and uh, the career path, how you got into it? Well, I got into it through through the passion profiling with the program. And well, what I do now is oversee financial affairs for families and, and businesses, uh, helping them helping them figure out how to best invest to to reach your financial goals now uh what in your opinion uh, what is the importance of managing money as a professional athlete we see many athletes nowadays that struggle with money well the, my opinion is that uh, as a young man when you're a professional athlete you you make more money than you know what to do with and 
you I'm, I'm stereotyping but typically the player won't find a good person they can trust to talk about it and the importance of it is to help understand how to budget your money because it's not going to last your entire lifetime and, and you're naive at that at that point in your in your youth and you you don't realize that you need to know how much to spend to make this stuff last and continue to grow and while you continue to accumulate those big dollars and you know, most guys just start outliving their means they think they're living within their means because they're making that much but when that stops and they it's very, very difficult for anyone, as for that matter, to to stop spending at the rate they've been used to, they've come accustomed to. Do you think players should be put in classes to help them learn better and understand managing money? Were you ever put in classes like this when you were playing in the NHL? No, we didn't have classes. Um, you were basically on your own. You were, ba- you, you know, you had to um, find someone. To trust to, to help you with it. I remember asked actually uh, where my first advisor came from. I asked around the locker room what to do with this money, and Johnny Stevens actually referred me to um, to a financial advisor who helped me first get situated and understand the importance of of saving and, and putting money away into retirement accounts first and maxing those benefits out and, and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm thankful. I got to give credit to my parents too on that for that matter because they really helped teach me about money at a young age, and so I knew the principles and the importance of saving, but the actual nuances of where to put it and what to invest in is is what I really uh, really benefited from with working with a professional. Now, as a now as being a professional in this financial industry and in financial advising services. Is there any advice you give your clients nowadays, uh, anything specific that helps them grow as a person and financially? Well, the most important thing is nothing to do with the investing. The most important thing is having the plan actually in place before you even start talking about the investments because if you don't have a plan, it's just like it's just like any hockey team. If you don't have a, your processes and you don't have a game plan, you're you're not going to have a chance at winning. So we really focus on the upfront uh, information gathering and profiling to get each client aligned with the right strategy that matters that matches their their personality and their goals. Where can people reach out for your advising? Is there anything you'd like to promote? Your website information? Oh yeah, um, yeah. You can you can search that easily by just putting my name. That my my web page pops right up. But it's um, www.fa.ml.com slash Jesse Bolaris um, and phone number nine one nine eight two nine two zero four five. Um, yeah, as I said before, I'm in Philly a lot. Uh, we actually got a good bit of clients up there, so we're there regularly making a business trip while visiting family and enjoying cheesesteaks in the shore mm-hmm. and all, all all my good friends up there. We'll be sure to uh, tweet out your information and put it on our website. One final question about hockey for you. Uh, you talked about how you still watch hockey today. Is there anybody that you would like to take on in a fight if you were given the opportunity to get on that ice again? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I, am, I am so happy I'm done with that. I mean, you know, it's never like I was a passionate fighter. I, I, well, I, I wasn't passionate about fighting. I was passionate about hockey, yeah. and I did whatever it took to to, have, to play in the NHL. So, no thanks. I, I do not <laughs> care to to fight another human being the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesse, we thank you for coming on with us. We appreciated your time and the look back into your career. Uh, thank you in Philadelphia. Thank you for all your great years here. Uh, thanks so much for having me, guys. Thank Enjoy you. your day. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. Take care. Thanks, thanks guys. Bye. Bye. This concludes our podcast of Sports and Rants with Brent and Pants. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Twitter at Sports and Rants. Like us on Facebook, remember to subscribe to us on iTunes, and visit our website, www.sportsandrants.blogspot.com. It would help our rankings on iTunes if you rate and review our podcast. Thanks, and have a good day.